One of the most important tools our children can leave our house with is a wise set of moral boundaries. That's going to be the topic of our time together today as I continue my Survival Guide series. Hey, I'm Jay Holland, and I want to welcome you to Let's Parent on Purpose. This is a podcast for families who want to thrive and not just survive their parenting years. Each week, I'll bring you an insight or an interview that will help strengthen your marriage, parenting, or your walk with Jesus. If you find this podcast helpful, I would ask that you subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also go to letsparentonpurpose.com and search for past topics, as well as get a hold of free resources that I've created to help your family. I recently asked you to go onto iTunes and leave some reviews because that helps other people find this podcast. A couple of you did that, and I just want to give a quick thank you to KickBlack7809 as well as 8Champy3 uh, for their reviews. Uh, Kickback7809 actually said, if you haven't checked out the older episodes, they would highly recommend episode 140, which I would as well. That's one of my favorite all-time episodes where I interview operator Nathan Buchanan from Chick-fil-A with the title Chick-fil-A Can Teach Us a Lot About Parenting. Uh, some really good gold in some of those old episodes. Uh, if you want to know more about them, you can go to letsparentonpurpose.com and search the podcast archives uh, that's a good way to find you because you can go in and type um, subject headings, things you're looking for, and um, probably I've covered it by this point. Um, at least I think that. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's just topic after topic after topic to still come. So thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, if you're new to the podcast, uh, I do have a free gift I want to give you. That's a ebook that I made called Fun Family Conversations. You can get it by texting the word THINGS, T-H-I-N-G-S, to 66866. That's THINGS to 66866. And I'll send you that Fun Family Conversations ebook, as well as a few other things that will help you in your marriage and parenting journey. I do want to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor of the podcast, and that's the Lake Tahoe's Couple Getaway. This is a four-day, three-night experience located at the only waterfront resort in Tahoe, the Hyatt Regency. Uh, I'm really hoping I can figure out a way to get out to this. It's November 13th through 16th. Uh, the main speaker of the weekend is Emerson Egerts of the book Love and Respect, which I absolutely love. Uh, Brandon Heath and Big Daddy Weave, both Grammy nominees, will be doing concerts and worship uh, lakeside. There's hiking, a dinner cruise on the water, ice skating, and a lot more. Uh, for everything included, the, the getaway is priced at $499 per person, um, but you can also do a payment plan if you want, um, just to space it out over time. Uh, and that includes your lodging, the conference, and, and a lot of the special treats that they have. If you're interested in this Tahoe Couples Getaway, you can go to tahoecouplesgetaway.com slash L-P-O-P. That's tahoecouplesgetaway.com slash L-P-O-P. And that's how they'll know that you listen to this podcast and I sent you that way. And as we jump into today's discussion, I want to give you a little bit of a background. Um, so I've been doing student ministry for 20 years, actually maybe a little bit over 20 years right now, because I started uh, my first youth pastor job in December of 1999. Uh, I've also got uh, children from second grade through actually a recent graduate uh, this year. And so one of the things just in student ministry and then especially with my own kids is I've spent a lot of time trying to think through what are the key principles and core elements that my kids need uh, when they leave my house, when they're on their own, uh, when they need to make their own decisions. And so uh, over the years I've kind of compiled, I actually started with resources from a book that Andy Stanley wrote called Seven, Seven Checkpoints for Student Ministry. Um, and then I've expanded it to, I think, about 12 different uh, checkpoints or principles. And these are things that, as a youth pastor, um, I teach over and over and over again uh, to students. Um, you know, there are a lot of things in the Bible that, that we need to cover, but during that 11 to to uh, 18 year old time period, there are just some core things that I feel like if if we don't implant them during that time period, some of them are just really hard to get uh, as you get older. Um, you can get them, but generally there's a lot of regret that comes with them uh, the older you get. So uh, I, I've hit several of them so far, uh, including wise choices, meaningful friendships, um, and and some others. Others first uh, today. 
I'm going to talk about one of the most essential and maybe one of the ones that as moms and dads, we get the most nervous about, and that's moral boundaries. Uh, And so today I want to actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a talk that I gave to our 11th, uh, 11 year olds through high school seniors. So I have to be careful sometimes how I, um, you know, the language and and how detailed I get. So there's not going to be anything graphic involved in this. Um, But some of these discussions, actually, you could start having um, much younger uh, with your kids. Uh, And you'll see that as as we go on. Um, So this, the idea of this talk, the idea of of what I shared with them is I want to give them a foundation for understanding the real reason that they want purity. Um, You know, because we tell tell kids all the time, you know, you need to pursue purity. You need to pursue purity. Well, why be pure? And so that's kind of the, the basis of today. Now, in the wise choices talk, one of the things that I shared with our students was that a wise person makes moral judgments and installs moral guardrails before feelings get turned up high. Now, you think about that. As you're driving along the road, um, I'm, I live in Florida now, and so guardrails are kind of important, but honestly, most of the roads are extremely straight. Um, but I grew up in West Virginia, and if anybody has ever driven through West Virginia, uh, Interstate 64 that goes through West Virginia, you've driven on the turnpike. And this is one of the most um, insane highways in the nation. Uh, they, you know, it's it's one of the few toll roads that I actually don't mind paying money to go on because, man, they had to like cut through mountains to make this road. And so there's so many, you know, wild turns, there's runaway truck ramps off of it, uh, and there are guardrails everywhere. And I have never encountered a guardrail on that road that I've been offended by. I've never encountered a guardrail on that road where I thought, man, I just wish they hadn't have blocked my view of, of the, you know, the mountain scenery here because everywhere there's a guardrail, it's because there's a potential for you to fall off a cliff and kill yourself along the way. And, and I'm really glad that they went ahead and put the guardrails up before I drove along that road. Uh, and in the same way in our lives, um, I know that there's going to be times in my life uh, where there is particularly high temptation. Uh, you know, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that's the acronym HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. These are going to be times where your temptation level is higher than normal. Uh, and it's, by the way, this is not just a talk for uh, your children. This is a talk for me and you. So you know there's going to be times when your temptation level is higher. And so what you want to do is you want to put up guardrails in your life uh, during those times of lower temptation when you have irrational thoughts, uh, when you're not, you know, in the moment, super feely, so that when you get in the moment, uh, you, you know, if you hit the guardrail, you've still not done a ton of damage. The damage is when you go over the cliff. So uh, with that thought, what we want to do is figure out how to choose what's best instead of what feels strongest. So the way that I actually introduced this um, talk with our young people is I went out and bought a bunch of Klondike ice cream bars, um, which I just, I wish that Klondike would sponsor this program. Then all of my troubles would be gone. I could just eat ice cream bars and do this, but alas, Klondike hasn't called yet. Um, So listeners support it and Lake Tahoe company supports it right now. Lake Tahoe Getaways company supports it. But I gave every student a Klondike bar and I let them start eating the Klondike bar. Um, And I shared uh, Revelation chapter four, verse 11 with them that says, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou has created all things and for thy pleasure, they are and were created. And I brought out the fact to them that not only were they created uh, for the pleasure of God, they're not just created by God, uh, they're created for God, and they're created for God's pleasure. And in addition to that, uh, the things that they take pleasure in are created by God. And so as, as they ate their ice cream bars, and I watched them because I couldn't stuff my mouth full of ice cream as I taught, uh, I, I reminded them of the fact that God is the one that created taste buds, and he didn't have to do that. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the fact that God could have just created um, two taste buds? The one that says, yes, eat this, it will help your body. And the other one that says, no, don't eat this, this will kill you. Uh, 
He could have done that and we would have survived just fine. But he created taste buds in such a way where you can have such incredible joy and pleasure out of eating. Now, we know that as humans, we screw this up just like everything else, and then we overindulge and overeat and, you know, uh, struggle with obesity and everything else. But the fact of the matter is that, that God created taste buds, and they're created for His pleasure. Because as I eat, I should be able to marvel in the creation of God and in His wisdom and power and majesty, the fact that He created the cocoa bean and the sugar plant and all of the things that go in, and cows to produce ice cream, um, the polar cows that make the ice cream that goes together with your chocolate covering for your Klondike bar. So God created taste buds, and it's magical. And then I pointed out the fact that once upon a time in the universe, there was no sex. And then God created sex. It was his idea. It wasn't our idea. It wasn't, um, it wasn't Instagram's idea or Snapchat's idea. God's the one that created sex. And God knows more about sex than anyone, more than you, more than me. And if you remember the Super Bowl here recently, even more than J-Lo and Shakira. God is interested in your sex life. God is interested in your, in your child's sex life. God is interested in your sex life. I mean, God wants you to know that there's something even better than sex. But I think it's important for you to understand that God cares about your sex life. God cares about your sexuality. Um, He's the one that created it for pleasure. And ultimately, it it should be something that um, causes us to worship God uh, for for the wonder and majesty of what he created. But there's something even better than sex, and that's intimacy. Now, I think it's important that we describe intimacy because sometimes that word, um, just like every word, it gets skewed uh, as far as definitions go. So let me give you the definition of intimacy that we use. And I think this is, I think I originally got this from Andy Stanley. There's some of these real core principles for teaching kids that Andy Stanley um, was just masterful at coming up with how to communicate. So intimacy is this, the joy of knowing someone and being fully known without fear of rejection. So intimacy is the joy of knowing someone and being fully known without fear of rejection. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about your friendships. I want you to think about your relationship with your spouse, with other people. The closer you get to them, the more you know them. Um, Do you, does your fear of rejection lower or does your fear of rejection raise? You know, depending on what you've done, depending on what you've been involved in, depending on your trust level with that person, your fear of rejection could go higher the more they know about you. And and this is the opposite of what we want, and this is the opposite of God's design. God's design is that the more that we know and the more that we understand somebody, uh, we should uh, embrace them. And so intimacy is is even deeper than this longing for sex that's inside us, we have a longing for intimacy. We have a longing for intimacy with one another, and there's a longing for intimacy with God. And, and often what makes us run and hide from God is this fear of rejection. Now, we need to understand that sex and intimacy are connected. Sex and intimacy are connected. We live in a culture that tells us that sex is primarily physical, but the truth is that sex is primarily relational. Let me say that again, because I think it's really important, Um, especially our children live in a culture that, that teaches them that sex is primarily physical, that it's a bodily act. You know, you have bodily sensations. If you've got an itch, you scratch it. And if you've got a sexual desire, you might as well fulfill it because it's just a bodily desire. And there's no connection otherwise. And so you can, you know, pass around from partners. You can do all of this stuff. And it's just a, a physical function. But we know, we know that that's not true. Sex is primarily relational. Even before being physical, it's relational. You know, we know this is true. I can, I can give you a couple examples of that. Um, if, if you have broken an arm, uh, or if you've broken a leg at some point in your life, let's say in childhood, like you fell down and, and you broke something, and so you had to go to the doctor, and, and maybe you even had to have surgery for it. You don't spend, typically, and like unless it's just shattered beyond repair, you don't spend the rest of your life um, centering your life around the fact that you broke your arm or broke your leg. 
it doesn't uh, tend to affect, you know, you go back to the same activities, you rehabilitate yourself and you go on. You don't typically live in fear of that. It doesn't tend to spider web into the way that you do other things. But if you're young and you have gone through some kind of um, sexual trauma, whether you've been inappropriately touched or, or it's gone beyond that, these things can affect you your entire life. Not just physically, but they can, they can, I mean, people that, that have this stuff happen to them when they're a child, um, struggle with intimacy often their entire life. And also people who have affairs struggle to regain intimacy, you know, and if sex were just physical, that wouldn't be the case, but it is. Um, so even though we live in a culture that will try to tell you, you know, you're as long as everybody's consenting, you're free to go and do whatever you want with whoever you want. We all know this isn't true. And I said, you know, I, you know, gave the example to the teenagers, you know, you think about it, you don't feel like your mom and dad have the rights to, to go pursue sexual activity with anybody that they want. Um, you, even if it's somebody else that's consenting, you feel like you have a right to have an expectation of them that that's not true. Why? Because it's not just physical. It's far more than that. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You know, what does that mean? Uh, well, I, I think without exploring the absolute theological depths of it, um, there is something, there is some kind of spiritual connection with our especially sexual activity. Uh, you know, some would think that, that sexual activity, you know, it, it can often feel like worship, uh, but unfortunately it can get into the realms of, of you know, not worshiping the Lord. Um, there's something um, deep and beyond physical in, in many ways, spiritual and mental and emotional, you know, there's your whole being involved. Um, and so there's a defilement of, of yourself. Now it doesn't mean there's not forgiveness. Um, but there's a, there's a memory of these things. There's the, you know, it's ingrained in your mind. There's chemical reactions that happen that deeply ingrain this stuff in you. Um, and so you've, you've sinned against your own body. You've, you've made it much, much harder for your body um, to have self-control, to, to pursue godliness. And so, you know, I said that, that at the very beginning the, that our goal is to pursue purity. Now, why do we pursue purity? Because purity paves the way for intimacy. Purity paves the way for intimacy. It's through purity that we can know somebody and fully know them without fear of rejection. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, if you want to have great sex in your life, great sex is a byproduct of maximum intimacy because sex is highly relational. Uh, you know, you think about it, that go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2 is the first, um, the first instance of, uh, of sex in the Bible, and it's in the creation story. It's Adam and Eve, two becoming one flesh. And this was marriage. Um, this was marriage. And it was designed by God, uh, the sexual activity is designed by God to glue people together. You know, you, if you're married, you, you know that uh, you, marriage doesn't fix all your problems. Marriage just reveals a whole new set of problems. You have two people who have their own self-will, uh, who have bad breath in the morning, who have their own various sloppy or lazy or selfish habits, uh, who have their own desires, and who used to be able to put on more of their best foot forward for one another, and now all of a sudden they're in each other's space all the time. They're in each other's finances all the time. They have to come to agreement and make decisions. And God has given us the gift of sex to glue those people together. Now, think about it, though. If you, if, if you spend your glue before marriage, um, there's a couple of different things that happen. One is, is it you know, you can get into a damaging relationship because because as you get physically intimate with somebody, it blinds you to some danger areas. You know, it connects you just like God designed sex to connect in marriage. Connect in marriage, it connects you to this person, and you start to lower your guard, and you start to have your blinders down, and you don't see all of the danger signs that you're supposed to see. The other is, 
you know, if you are connected to this person and then you go and you're physically involved with this person and then you're physically involved with this person and then you're physically involved with this person, you know, the stickiness of physical intimacy starts to, to wear off. You know, it's kind of like, I, you remember those, those little sticky toys you used to get as prizes on stuff like the wall walkers and stuff like that. And they're very sticky to start, but everything that it sticks to, it kind of brings with them a little bit. And pretty soon they're covered in lint and dirt and they don't stick to anything anymore. And that's what happens when we begin to, to give our intimacy glue out to person after person after person. Um, there's a ripping of the flesh when we rip away from them, but pretty soon there's not the stickiness that's needed to be. So we need to realize that it's impossible to just, quote, have sex. You're joining of fleshes, and there are consequences when you join to flesh and then you rip away. Um, let me share with you one of the most important passages in the Bible regarding our moral purity. First Corinthians or First Thessalonians chapter four, starting in verse one says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you knows how to control his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warn you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, who gives, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. You know, think about the fact that there's very few things in your life where you absolutely know the will of God. And I've often thought before, man, even now, at this point in my life, Lord, if you would just show up and specifically tell me what your will is, I would do it. You know, you want me to go to India? You want me to move to Ohio? Uh, you know, you want me to continue in, in this job, whatever it is, Lord, I want to do it. And here we have in first Corinthians or first Thessalonians chapter four, a very specific statement for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That means that you would be set apart, that you would abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So this is the will of God for our life. And it's for his pleasure and for our pleasure, you know, I think that's, if you get that concept that the things that God wants for you are not just for his pleasure, but they're the greatest possible things for you over the long haul, over the long run, and often in the moment as well. And so we need to realize, and this is, this is how, what I told the children, children, they are all children. Sex is not for mature people. Sex is not for ready people. It's not for in love people. It's for married people. You know, it's sex is for married people, and it's something designed to help them grow in intimacy. And that's the joy of knowing someone and being fully known without fear of rejection. And purity paves the way for intimacy. So that's purity while I'm single. Um, and, and that means not physically messing around with people, but it's also absolutely guarding your eyes. I'm working through Matthew chapter six right now, memorizing it. And I think it's around verse, um, 21 or somewhere real close to there where Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Uh, if therefore your, uh, your eye is good, then your whole body, body will be full of light. Um, but if your eye is full of darkness, how great the darkness and how true is that with our moral purity? It's not just my physical actions, it's my eyes as well. And that purity will help pave the way for intimacy, intimacy with God and intimacy with the people around me. They stop being objects um, for my own gratification, and I remember that they're humans made in the image of God. So let's finish with some common sense, and, and I'm going to post this in the show notes um, the common sense things. I'll, I'll try to post a number of these principles in there um, from this, from this, because I know you can hear this and then you'll want to remember some things and you may not be able to remember them all. So I'll, I'll post most of the key statements from today in the show notes, including these. Uh, if, if you're trying to help establish guardrails, like I said in the beginning, a wise person establishes guardrails when the, the, uh, the feelings are low so that they're in place when the feelings are high. These are ones that are not just common sense, 
But I can tell you from experience, from uh, failing as a teenager and also doing better and succeeding as an adult, here, here are the principles that, that are wise to live by. The further you go, the faster you go. So, you know, if you're thinking about, well, how far is too far? What, what can be done physically in a relationship? Understand this. The further you go, the faster you go. The further you go, the further you want to go. You know, the, it, it's not like getting a little bit of physical action makes you satisfied. It just whets your appetite. So the further you go, the further you want to go. Next, the further you go, the harder it is to go back. And, and if you're listening to this, maybe you've experienced this as well and can absolutely agree. The further you go, the harder it is to go back. Once you've crossed some boundaries, it's just harder to go back. And so you need to figure out how to draw lines. And where you draw the line determines three things. Number one, the arena of your temptation. Number two, the intensity of your temptation. And number three, the consequences of giving in to temptation. So the arena of your temptation, you know, I, do, I think I use the example of holding hands, okay? So let's say that you uh, decide, you know what, I really want to pursue purity, and so I'm not even going to hold hands with somebody, because I just needed an example to use. I'm not even going to hold hands with somebody. And so now your temptation is the temptation of holding hands. And, you know, you resist and resist, and maybe you fall and you actually accidentally hold hands with somebody. Um, well, you have not fallen that far, you know, and, and you have the warning light going on of, oh, maybe things are getting a little bit too heated because I accidentally held hands with them. Um, so the arena of your temptation is not terribly high stakes. Number two, the intensity of your temptation. If you think that it's a hard temptation to keep yourself from holding somebody's hand, wait until you start holding hands and then see how hard it is to resist kissing them. And if you draw your arena of temptation as, I'm only going to kiss, then just wait until you start kissing and realize the intensity of emotion and feelings that come with that. You don't want to go backwards. And then number three, the consequences of giving in to temptation. Again, you hold hands with somebody. Uh, hey, maybe you just passed the coronavirus around, and so maybe you'll die from it. But most likely, you can wash your hands. Uh, you'll be okay. But the further your physical boundaries are, the greater the consequences of temptation. So the further you go, the faster you go. The further you go, the further you want to go. The further you go, the harder it is to get back. And where you draw the line determines the arena of your temptation, the intensity of your temptation, and the consequences of giving in to temptation. Hey, these are survival guidelines that will help you not just survive, but thrive. It, it will put you and your children in the spot that God would have them be so that when the right person comes along, uh, you are ready. And, and not just ready in the sense that you're morally ready, but that you're in the right spot. You know, imagine if the godly, good, right person came along, but you were already attached and messing around physically to the wrong person. That right, godly person is just going to keep on going. So wisdom and common sense uh, will help you go a long way. Remembering that the gospel is still true if you've messed up. You know, I it took me a, a long time in my young years to figure this stuff out and get it right, and a lot of stumbling and bumbling. Um, there is the grace of Jesus. Uh, there are sins be as scarlet. He will wash us as white as snow. Um, so I don't live in penance of my mistakes. I don't live trying to make up my mistakes. I live as a freed person that never wants to go back into slavery. That's what I want to do. I want to pursue intimacy with God, not slavery to my flesh. Hey, I hope this is helpful to you. Um, I'm going to post this stuff in uh, again in the show notes. And I actually made, if you've listened this far, you get a special treat. Um, so I made a number of years ago a video, a Dora the Explorer video uh, that I showed in youth group um, called Dora Pursues Purity, where I took these lessons and I kind of played them out in, in kind of a little funny form. And it's like a 20 minute episode. If I can figure out how to get it posted on YouTube, I'm going to also link that in the show notes. So check out letspaintonpurpose.com, the show notes for this episode of, of Moral Boundaries, and you might be able to find a little treat. Dora pursues purity. Friend, thanks so much for listening today. I pray it's been a blessing to you. And if it has, 
please share this episode with somebody that you care about. If God lays it on your heart, I'd love for you to consider joining our Patreon support community. You can find out about that by going to lessparentonpurpose.com. Finally, if you've got a topic that you'd like to hear me address, send me an email at jay at lessparentonpurpose.com or give me a shout on the Let's Parent on Purpose Facebook page. Hey, please never forget that parenting is a marathon, not a sprint, and that you need a good church family to thrive through all the different challenges that you're going to face. Keep pointing each other to Jesus and enjoy the gift of life that God's giving you today. Hey, whatever season you're in, it won't always be this way. So set your hope on Christ and not your circumstances. Have a blessed day, and I'll talk to you soon.